I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. close to my heart, close to my family, knew my mom and dad, and he was actually the first black mayor of New England from 1981 to 1987. His name is the Honorable Thurman Milner. Welcome, Mr. Thurman. Oh, <laughs> good seeing you again. Uh, Me too. <laughs> Sam, I, have, I, I don't get out as often as I do, but it's good to get out and see you and also to see Stan McCauley again. I haven't seen him for quite a while. And Hartford does not, I'm not too sure Hartford's aware of the history, of the black history or Latino history of what we have here. When I moved here in the 70s and things are going and when you became the first black mayor of New England, and New England is not just Connecticut, it runs from here to Maine, how historical this really is within the black history uh, genre. But um, I want you to let people know who you are, what you are, and what you've been about. Well, one thing, that's one thing I always say during Black History Month. You hear about Frederick Douglass and all the others, <laughs> but our local people don't hear about the history here in the city of Hartford. Right. Not just myself, people like Wilbur Smith and right. others that contributed for many, many years. Right. And they need to learn so they'll know actually Hartford's history, which is a great history. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born and raised in Hartford. My ancestors were slaves in Middletown, okay. Connecticut. Right. So my family's been here since the 1700s. Okay. Um, I grew up with uh, five brothers and one sister and not mm -hmm. a street of us left. Okay. And grew up mainly in the north end of Hartford. <clears throat> uh, went to uh, Arsenal School, then okay. Northeast Junior High, then the Hartford High, then the Glassbury High, and back to Hartford. Okay. Uh, to the Air Force and okay. And got involved with the civil rights movement. Uh, mm -hmm. I met uh, Dr. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. while I was working in New York. I was a uh, junior pharmacist at the time, working in the Union Pharmacy. Okay. Uh, and Do Dr. King came to the pharmacy to recruit people to get involved in the movement as well as to raise some finances. Mm -hmm. uh, it was then that I actually got involved in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Birmingham, Alabama, then went to uh, Albany. Georgia, and uh, the night Dr. King came out of jail and did some demonstrating with him, and mm -hmm. then a young Andrew Young and a young uh, uh, the mm -hmm. Reverend uh, Lowry. No, Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson. They were both 17 at the time. Okay. And uh, so they were called the Young Turks of the Civil Rights Movement. Okay. Um, as when I moved here and time went on, I felt comfortable in Hartford. That was yesteryear. The times has changed. And since you were mayor to now, what would you would have done different if you was mayor right now? Well, basically, I, I still feel comfortable in Hartford myself. Right. Uh, I have moved now from uh, Myrtle Street right. to Albany Avenue. Okay. And right. I get up every morning, All right. walk down Albany Avenue, okay. up to Keeney Park, okay. down uh, Green Greenish, Greenish Street, right. down to Blue Hills, right. and back up Albany Avenue. Okay. Uh, everyone, and people ask me the same thing, you know, you know, why you walk out there by yourself that early in the morning? I said, well, I've said the same thing as when I was mayor. If I can't feel safe in my own city, right. then no one else can feel safe. The city has changed. What happened, in, as you remember, in, in our days, if you threw a stone, uh, that was the worst thing you could possibly do. Right. Uh, now it's, it's nothing for a young person to pick up a gun right. uh, and just fire it. Right. Uh, recently we had two 
young ladies in Hartford that were uh, actually one was gunned down, and the other just died in a fight. Right. But you know things have changed tremendously all over the nation, not only in Hartford. Right. Uh, basically, our city has changed. I think the focus has to go back to people, mm -hmm. and that's you know we're, we're looking at education, doing a good job with education, thanks mainly to the governor. Right. Uh, but as far as getting Hartford people employed into jobs in Hartford, that right. still doesn't happen. Uh, you can get up early in the morning and see all the cars coming into our city. Then four or five o'clock, they all go out. This not only this this is not only people going out. Right. Uh, this is taxpayers' dollars. Uh, this is use of our police and fire department. And this has not changed. Uh, right. It's probably gotten worse. Right. Uh, since the eighties. I um. I made a promise to Pastor Lanier. Hmm. A lot of people don't know who she was, but beautiful she, woman. Thank you, yeah. and yourself, that when I started MC Square Technology, I was trying to make things different in Hartford. Hmm. And the, the roadblock is actually the politics side of it, the politicking, or we don't like each other. Hmm. And I think that's a stumbling block, a major stumbling block within the north end of Hartford. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I don't say this too often, but I always tell people, had I not been an African-American mayor, mm. uh, I would probably be rich. Uh, but, right. but basically, I, I am not. I still live on Albany Avenue, and right. I, I'm still basically just drawing Social Security. Right. But I, I, I enjoy, uh, you know, my lifestyle because I never, worked, I never had anything anyway. Mm. But, you know, that's the difference, I think, and in, in, it hasn't changed at all. Like, you know, your, your, your project, everybody knows it's a, a very good project, mm -hmm. but nobody wants to adapt it. They want to take it away from you and mm -hmm. use it, but right. actually letting you be the uh, promoter of it is, right. is tough. Um, and that has not changed. That's gotten worse in Hartford. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, uh, as our population begins to shrink, it is, it's even getting worse than it mm -hmm. has been in the past. What happened really was when we were in a position to really begin to do something, right. uh, we neglected to do it. And exactly. other people came in and actually took over. You know, you can't blame others for coming in mm -hmm. and taking over when you're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear a lot of complaints about other people coming in and taking over the housing and, right. and the stores and the shops. Right. But that didn't have to happen. Right. They didn't come over and take over. They came in and took what we weren't doing. Right. I... um. That is true because not so much is happening here. It happens also where we, we worked and lived in New York. Right. And uh, if you look at Spanish Harlem, Spanish Harlem is not really run by a lot of Latinos of the grocery stores. It's owned by actually people from the Middle East. Hmm. If you go into Spanish Harlem, you wouldn't believe a lot of people from Pakistan and India and all these places own these stores now. But coming back to Hartford, um, I have a few articles I want to read off to you that one of my interns actually researched named Marcus Harris. It says, <clears throat> funds for jobs programs unused. And this article was written on 4-27-2013. And I'm going to read off part of it. It says, in early December, two weeks after State Department of Labor received $610,207 from the federal government to hire unemployed people for Storm Sandy cleanup, uh, money really wasn't used. And it's crazy because, you know, any municipality, rather it was right. in the San Diego area or not, right. could actually have, you know, chartered a bus and exactly. actually taken the unemployed down there and put them to work, you know, especially in your larger cities right. where the unemployment is, is escalating actually. You have more people in poverty and more people unemployed exactly. now than you had 20, 30 years ago. Exactly. And to see that kind of money go to waste right. doesn't make any sense. But I, I didn't hear anybody promoting that it or says, even mentioning that that was happening. It says no municipalities have applied for the money. And it says more than 900 people asked for the state about the temporary jobs, which was $15.50, but it was limited to people. It was unemployed. And... Why would you have other towns help out like a New Britain mm. or maybe a West Hartford right. and actually utilize high school kids and gave them something, but this is the only town that don't utilize what they have, mm. their resources, which you, which you said in the beginning is people. Right. 
Without the people, you go nowhere. Even when it you says get unemployed, you have look at the, look at the <laughs> magnitude of unemployed people you have in Harford, New Haven, and Bridgeport. They could have gotten on a charter bus and went down right. and I mean, do some work. And, and would have been glad to go. I'm glad to go for fifteen dollars and fifty cents. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's not the uh, money that you sneeze over today. Oh no. Um, let me read another article, and I know it's close to home to you. It says city out to recover twenty seven million state reimbursement on school projects held up. And it says the city has hired a consultant to try to recover $27 million of reimbursement for school construction projects, which actually started in 2003. Uh, we know some of these people that actually work with, went to dinner with, mm -hmm. that actually was head of the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the school uh, construction uh, committee. It says, uh, Mayor, uh, it says right here, Mayor Pedro Sagara says administrators have been working diligently to trying to recover $27.6 million. And it said it took an architect, Anthony Mata, to discover the problem last spring. Well, that's, that's the problem is, you know, the people within the administration weren't doing their due diligence a long time ago right. to follow up on when that money was coming in. You know, Hartford is always complaining about deficits and, and deficits. Right. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And it looked like someone would automatically have red lighted that and, and, and gotten on top of it. Uh, rather, they're, you know, the people that are in the construction business or the people at, in City Hall who are overseeing right. the project themselves or someone at the Board of Education. Right. There is no need for this kind of money. To, you know, and then you've got to begin to wonder how much more money is out exactly. there. Exactly that the city is not recovering. They have right here, uh, Breakthrough Magnet School on Brookville Street, Alfred E. Burr on Wethersfield Avenue, Classical Magnet on Woodland used to be Industrial Risk Insurers, the right. building, mm -hmm. and Dr. James A. Uh, H. Naylor, which is off of uh, Franklin and, and uh, whatever it is, right near, uh, what's that, uh, Poe Park, Naylor School, and the school that is the only school in the North End is Sarah J. Rawson. Right. Now, the other four schools is basically in the South End. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't like to bring up insult to injury, but Eddie Perez was one of the top mayors, I think, in 2001 to come aboard. Mm. They're trying to actually to build up Harford, to build up the school system, everything else, and some things went astray. Right. Now... <clears throat> I'm not trying to put anybody on the hook, but we went from the north end to the south end ideology. And he'd been on many a shows saying that what went wrong, what didn't go wrong, what he was doing, and how he was framed for stuff. But this was under his administration for $27 million. Mm. This is, is really a shame that you live in Hartford and I moved around this time because one of my projects was stolen. And you actually worked on it with right. me. Mm -hmm. You know that. So I'm saying to myself, why taxes keep going up and and we can't recover? This is a lot of money. This matter of fact can employ a lot of people that I look at it. Let me move on. This is actually close to your, your heart to you. It says, uh, this was actually October 10th, 2012. And I got this out of the Inquiry News. Mm -hmm. Larson announces funding for Jamoki Academy to improve students' achievement in Harford. And it says, uh, announced that Jamoki Academy has received a $100,000 grant through U.S. Department of Education collaboration given to only five schools nationwide. And I'm saying to myself, and says, enhance the services at Thurman L. Milner School, which is named after you. Since Dr. Richardson is gone, mm. and I'm not too sure of the Harford Charities is still a Catholic charities is still Catholic there. Still there. Okay, well they're still there because money's money. Mm. I have to say it like that. I'm Catholic. Mm. Um, you think this was a good move that it turned into a it's turned into a charter school and it was taken over, or you wanted to stay as actually a community type of school? No, it's not a charter school. Okay. It still is a community school. Okay. What happened is Jamoki Academy. Let me give you a little history of it. Okay. First of all. Um, uh, Dr. Sharp's mother right. uh, was the chairman of the Board of Education okay. and came to me in 1988 okay. and asked me if she could rename 
the uh, Vine, Street, Vine School. Street School. That was Thelma Dickerson. Right. Uh, she wanted to name it in my honor. Right. Her and uh, Courtney Gardner and yep. uh, uh, Sandra Little. Right. Know all of them. And uh, I sort of hesitated first because I was I, I would be the first living person to have a school named after. But one of the reasons she picked that particular school and the area it was in because I basically grew up. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say I grew up in a family on welfare and yep. we struggled. Yep. And this is the same situation in that area. Right. And for almost 20 years, the school has failed its students. Mm -hmm. And it had excellent principals. Now, right. you, Richardson and, and Chambers were right. both from excellent. But what was happening, they were not given the support that they needed from the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. Now, when they came to me, when Dr. Shop came to me and first told me he was talking to the board, he wanted to take over Milner. Mm -hmm. I was elated because I look at uh, Jamoki mm -hmm. students, you know, the academics of Jamoki. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about charter schools per se. Right. I'm talking about what the school is supposed to be doing, teaching students. Right. And after 20 years of students at Milner being neglected, I thought it was a great move. And if you go there now, mm -hmm. the kids are learning. Mm -hmm. The teachers are teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the greatest fears from the parents, would this be another experiment? Because you know they try something like uh, I forgot that thing they called it out of out of out of uh, Atlanta in the school one time, mm -hmm. and it had to be in a stabilized school. They brought it into Milner. Right. Well, Milner was not a stabilized school. Right. Because they changed teachers during the right. year as well as students in and out during the year. Right. Uh, so that, that system in Atlanta blew up. Mm -hmm. It went it went astray. Right. Because that matter of fact, the Atlanta school system is under investigation right now for actually changing grades and all that stuff. Right. So what happened is, uh, so when Jamoki came in, mm -hmm. I was elated because I knew the history. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a past president of NACP, and NACP, right. it was in opposition to charter schools, and for a good reason, because at one time they had taken all the resources right. away from the public schools. Right. But Jamoki has brought resources into Milner School. Right. Uh, they're not, they brought some excellent teachers in. Mm -hmm. uh, they doubled the staff there. Mm -hmm. uh, they brought an excellent principal in. Yeah. Uh, and they're teaching the kids. Mm -hmm. The kids are well behaved. Yep. Uh, about 20 years ago, the Hartford Public School System brought a teacher in there who was having kids run up and down the hall. Right. And, and we finally got rid of her, but it was almost a disgrace. And my problem is now the head of the teachers union, you know, because Jamoki, an African American right. organization, is running the school, right. is raising cane about what's happening at Milner. But when right. Milner was failing, you didn't hear from the you hear nothing from nobody. You know, the teachers are satisfied. Right. But it's not the teachers who are complaining. Right. It's the head of the union who's supposed to be representing the teachers. Right. And it's right. amazing to see when people are doing right, particularly African Americans, right. that others begin to come in and start uh, complaining. Right. I um one reason why I kept this article is because two reasons, not because of Larson got the money. Mm. Because I know that the school is there to you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. You probably remember when I went back in '09 and talked to Dr. Richardson for me helping out, and he said no. Mm -hmm. You saw me there on a Saturday, right, with, with Eddie when Eddie was still there before he uh, stepped down, and they overlooked what we could have done, mm -hmm. which we, you know, we could have helped out. Uh, but I'm glad that you know Jamoki. Um, overall posture of how they teach school is almost like what the Catholic kids do. Mm. Almost the same thing, stone structure. Boom, they keep coming at you, keep coming at oh, yeah. you, which is a good thing. Mm. It's like repetitious. Um, we have an article here on March 28, 2013, and I asked this question to one other person last week, and uh, they gave me an overall answer. Uh, Dr. Kishimoto closes Weaver early. What do you think about that? Well, number one, Weaver has always been a problem, but I, I, I think to close it before right. they actually decide what they're going to do to it right. uh, made no sense. Right. But that's a historic school in exactly. the north end of Hartford. Right. And I think if they're going to do anything, they, they need to map the plan out first, yep. decide what they're going to do, right. how they're going to do it, right. and not just close the school. Uh, because if they're going to do anything, I think it should be in the same area. Right. But before or they actually close the school and shift the students all over the city because what's going to happen when they do decide what to do, half the students are going to be spread all over the city right? and it's going to be tough 
getting the community, make it a community school again. Right. And I'm just afraid that it will become sort of a charter type school rather than a community school. This is this is what the talk is. The drums are saying is that when Weaver opens back up, if it does, mm. University of Ham University of Hartford will control the school. They're saying I, I I hope they'll be involved, but I don't want them controlling the school because. That's one of the fears with Artists Collective. They feel if something happens to Dolly, then the University of Harvard is going to step in and they take, take it over. The Artists Collective, these are historic African American entities in, in the north end of Harford. Right. We were, for number one, we were, at, you know, one time, my younger days, was all Jewish. It was all Jewish. Yeah, well, my, exactly. my, my older brother was one of the first blacks going to Weaver High School. Exactly. So, you know, it's, there's been a big change, but right. now the change is there, and the North End is still an African, more, mainly African American and Caribbean American community. Right. Uh, I think that historic, historic site should remain there, and I think closing it is going to send a signal that it's not going to reopen. They had a lot of famous people came out of the old Weaver mm. actresses and actors. Oh, yeah. And the, the crazy part about it is people don't understand how Weaver used to be. They look at how it is now, which they look at as a failing school. Uh, when we moved out of Connecticut, I mean, out of New York to come to Connecticut, my brothers and sisters graduated from the old Weaver, which mm. is Martin Luther King now. Yeah. At that time, I was at Kingswood and Northwest Catholic. Right. Two school. But the crazy part about it is, is, my brothers and sisters are not stupid, hmm. and you're not dumb either. So the thing about it is when I look at the history of Weaver, as I look at the history of yourself, there's a lot of history there. Oh, yeah. You know, I know John Lobin. Hmm. John Lobin is one uh, to premier one of the most, I guess, influential people in the Hartford area, mm -hmm. but he's low-key. He left from Weaver and went to Syracuse. Right. So when I look at, talk about as a failing school, I don't look at the people who was there that was failing. Um, if this, it's failing, you have to look at who's failing. failing it's exactly. not the students, and it's exactly. not the parents, it's not the community that's failing. I, I thought that Dr. Avramowski really hatched up the school. Mm. And I thought that, and this is my opinion now, but what I know and what I have been through the Hartford school system is that why would you chop the school up in the North End? Then when you leave, you have Dr. Kishimoto come and chop it up even more. What happened? Not only did he chop up the school, he chopped up the whole school system. Right. You know, one time, Harvard is a very transit city. Right. So students move, you know, most of Harvard are renters, right. Harvard community, and they move right. from one to the other. In my day, when you went to school, if I moved from one district to another, right. I'd be taught the same thing in that same class. Thank you. But now if you move, let's say you move a block away, right. you're going to go to a whole new subject. You're going to start all over again. That's how, <laughs> that's why many of our young people are failing. Right. I mean, because they got to start all over again. It's the different book. It's different. To me, it's different books. I mean, when I look at, ask somebody, do you not know, do a long division? And people say, what is it? If it's all put a culinary institute in Weaver, most African American folks, Know how to cook. You want to cook you, know, you, you know, you need to put that <laughs> somewhere else. Yeah, because you know, uh, most of our people learn how to cook. Like I learned how to cook when I was young. Exactly. It was, you know, so it was amazing that you know that's that's the kind of you know so I the kind of way they was, think. It was a waste of money. Look, well, it's right. not a waste of money. It's how how folks look at us. I, I you know the you know black folks love to cook, so let's put a yeah. culinary yeah. institute yeah. at Weaver High School. Uh, that don't make any you sense. You know, if if if. if African Americans want to learn how to cook. Right. They know where to go to learn how to cook. cook. Right. But to exactly. say they got to go to Weaver to learn how to cook makes no sense. I, um, I, I think that from the 2000 now, if you don't have a degree or something is not wor worded or a certain way, you don't get funding, or is not is not accredited, or is not actually um, what I would say, um, it, 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 it doesn't make any sense. Hmm. Uh, you don't have a certain person there from Hartford or whatever, it's not going to fly. You have people out there, believe me, it's smarter than Methuselah. They can do different things. But again, Hartford doesn't utilize their people. No, Hartford always going outside Thank to you. get someone to come in and and, and do, the, do what the people in Hartford can do. Exactly. And then they talk about Hartford, 
not doing anything. Right. Well, first of all, when you get people from outside to come into Hartford to do things, they're not going to do what's best for Hartford. Right. They're going to do what's best for, for themselves, themselves, for both themselves. Right. And that's been the one of the major problems, not only seekers, even insurance companies. Exactly. When I was a youngster, most insurance companies were Hartford based. Hartford based. And right. their CEOs were Hartford based. Base, right. Like Filer and some others. Right. And, and they did a lot of good for Hartford. Right. Now, when I was mayor and I went to see an insurance executive, right. he said, Well, I live in, in New York, so I can't really concentrate on Hartford, even though I'm CEO here. Right. And this is not happening in a lot of our other institutions as well as our educational institutions right. as well. Right, right. Um, I have an article here. It touches a little bit towards education, but it says Hartford takes a hit on the Malloy's budget. And this is actually. April 3rd, 2013, just recent, out of the actually Hartford Current. Mm. And it has a thing right here that says, um, the re actually retrying says, even it stands the pilot, which pilot is the, um, uh, what is this right here, what it stands for, the pay it says known as the payment in lien of taxes. Of taxes. Yeah. He's trying to recover $9 million reimbursement for the school construction project. Mm. Out of twenty-seven million. Yeah. Now, can you recover it? Maybe not, because the people that actually did the work on the schools is not from Connecticut mostly. No, they're all gone. But the they're thing all about gone. It is it, it's, it's, it's state funding, I believe. Right. And it should be able to recover it if they get their records straight. Right. But trying to get the records straight, as you say, it's going to be tough because the people that had the records and did the records are no longer here. No longer here. Right. Now it says, it says, without pilot, other cities in Connecticut would not be quite as difficult as position as Hartford. So state capital like Stanford, for example, the city where Governor Malloy was mayor for 14 years, he could not he could not more he could not do anything more difficult than actually Hartford could. Now in, in Stanford, you got to have a minimum of seventy eight thousand mm. dollars. In Hartford, the average thing is tw is thirty grand. Mm. They actually just to live in Hartford. The funny thing about this is, is that seventy-eight thousand dollars living in Stanford, which is eleven percent of the population, is, and and you got thirty percent living, thirty percent plus living unemployment in Hartford. Mm. We need these funds, right? There are people walking around in Hartford right now unemployed. Correct. There's people right now coming out of prison that is going to go right back to prison if they don't have something to do for 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 actually for programs. The sad part about it is, is that when you look at Harvard as the capital, why are we going backwards? Well, the main <laughs> thing is two things. You got to look at what Malloy done in two different ways. He's done in actually done some good and he's done some bad. Mm -hmm. The pilot is very critical, very important to a city like Harvard because we're the, we're the capital. Mm -hmm. But he did money for education, which he, which he brought more funding in. Mm -hmm. And he's what he's trying to do is balance both ways and. And, and you can't really do it that way because no. you're taking from one really needed project, you know, because mm. we fought for years and years to get the pilot program raised, to raised right. so they could pay more into cities like Hartford because we're the capital city. We're the capital city. So every state building in the city is under the pilot, which Thank means you. they don't get fair taxes on those buildings. Right. And most of our larger big companies are closing now, so you're still losing money. Right. And I, I understand his effort. Education that's key and that's important, but he should not have balanced that with the pilot program. He should have looked at other resources and other ways to sort of balance off and and, and do something for the cities, the major cities as well, because he's a former mayor. He should know better. He should, and he, and, and a matter of fact, um, I met him several times, even when he was mayor in uh, in, uh, in Stanford, because I lived down that way. The sad part about it is. Sometimes out of sight, out of mind. And what I mean by that is that you cannot take what's the ideology in Stanford and bring it to Hartford. No. It is, it's like the tales of two cities. From New York to New Haven is one world, and from New Haven to Springfield is another world. Oh, yeah. So that's why like I, I said, I think he's doing a lot of good stuff. Yes, but when that good stuff, he's sort of cutting short on other areas. Right. And I think that's what the, the pilot program is very important, very key, because even when I was mayor, we fought at the Capitol get the pilot increased. Right, because it's necessary. Um, at that time, who was um, who was those governor at that time? O'Neill. O'Neill. That's right. At governor first, first was uh, Grasso, then O'Neill. Yeah. Right. She died from cancer. Mm. Um, 
This is the last article, and we have maybe a few minutes left. It says, West Hartford superintendent is among the highest paid in Connecticut for the district. In our district, um, Dr. Kishimoto um, is overseeing 22,000 students, and she's making about um, 241000 and she has a stipend of about um, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. So it's like two fifty. I get to understand that her contract is up this year. Mm. Who else is coming in to take her place? Well, we never know. It probably be from somebody from out of town, <laughs> uh, more than likely. Uh, you know, that two hundred fifty thousand half quarter million dollars looks good to anybody. That's twice the salary of the of the mayor, basically. Exactly. And. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing. You know, the superintendent run, runs all the schools, right. and the mayor runs the whole city. Right. And she gets, you know, double the amount. Right. But that's not amazing because when I was mayor, I was getting seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. Right. Right. The mayor now gets seven times more than I was receiving uh, when I was mayor. Right. Uh, so I definitely wasn't in it for the money. So. <laughs> well, but this is what we got to do since we're almost out of time. Okay. I have, I have to bring you back. Mm. Hopefully, um, you can be a contributor to towards. Uh, Education one, but we have to bring you back. There's a lot more stuff to talk about. But it's good seeing you. It's good seeing you again <laughs> too, and uh, good to be in the studio of, of Stan McCullough. Oh boy, I tell you, he has moved a long way for the last 20 years from Channel Five. He continues to move up. That's good. Well, that's it for our program for this week on Education One. Next week we have a mover and shaker of actually out of the NRZ coming actually next week. Her name is Hyacinth Yeti. If this Tuesday. Is Education One. Thanks for tuning in. I see you on the internet. Have a blessed day. <laughs>